The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. She's won more Olympic medals for Canada than any other athlete in our history. Tonight, a feature interview with swimmer Penny Alexiak about winning and being a legend at 21. Then, the Trans-Canada Trail spans from coast to coast to coast, and in the COVID era, we'll hear why it's got a good story to tell. Also, did you know that you can surf on the Great Lakes? We'll hear about that too. It's Tuesday, October 12th, and that's all next on The Agenda. At 16, Penny Alexiak stunned the swimming world, winning gold and setting an Olympic record in the process at the 2016 Games in Rio. Turns out, that was just the beginning. And now at the ripe old age of 21, she's got seven Olympic medals, making her the most decorated Canadian Olympian in history. And fresh from training today, it seems Penny Alexiak is not done yet. She joins us now from the Swim Canada Training Centre right in Scarborough, Ontario, is that your hometown, incidentally? Um, Toronto is, yeah. Toronto is, okay. Well, it's all Toronto now, that's true. Uh, I want to start just uh, by taking you back a little bit. Let's go back to Tokyo, and here's the finals of the 100-meter relay. Sheldon, roll it, please. Penny Alexiak has Canada in a bronze medal position, and for Penny Alexiak, it'll be a bronze medal, her seventh medal at the Olympics, and a bronze medal. That's the one. That was medal number seven. That bronze making you the most decorated athlete in Canadian history at the Olympics. I, I appreciate that this is a, a cliched question, but it seems the right place to start. How meaningful is it to you to be the most decorated Canadian Olympian ever? Um, I mean, it's honestly more weird for me than anything else. I feel like just... Um, Knowing myself, I look at myself as like the same grade nine kid that I was when I was 14, honestly. Like I see myself that way no matter how old I am. And so for me, it's really weird. And I'll always say to my friends, it's such a weird thing that it's actually me that has seven medals and is the most decorated athlete. But I mean, just to be able to represent Canada and to be able to be the most decorated athlete in Canada, that's it's just insane to me. Now, you broke the record of Cindy Clausen and Clara Hughes, both of whom had six. Have you spoken to either or both of them since you got the seventh medal? Um, I haven't got to speak to either of them directly, unfortunately. However, um, I did get a message from one of the girls uh, when I was doing an interview pretty much just after the Olympics. And um, I think it was Cindy and she was like super sweet and really kind and I'm just like really grateful that I'm even that well known on the world stage like that. Nice. Where are all the medals incidentally, Penny? Um, I mean, ideally my mom would want them in the safe uh, <laughs> at on like RBC branch or something like that. But um, for me, I like to keep them just with me in my sock drawer or something like that. Are you kidding? That's where they are in a sock drawer? Uh, I don't want to give too much away. I don't want anyone to come to my house. But right now, they are, but they're going to go in the safe soon, I swear. That sounds like a good move. Okay, very nice. I watched that YouTube video that you made, uh, which uh, I have to say was quite adorable, and in it you said, your greatest fear in life is open water, which, of course, yeah. makes no sense to me. So can you please explain how the greatest swimmer in Canadian history is somehow afraid of open water? I'm, I'm not afraid of pools sometimes. It depends. Like, if I'm by myself in a pool, it's a little scary. I, I always like to think of how many sharks could fit in the pool with me. But, um, no, I can't do open water. I'm terrified. I'll start, like, crying and, like, hyperventilating as soon as I'm in open water. And I've tried everything, and it just, I can't get over my fear. Do you appreciate that that makes no sense at all? Yeah, no, I definitely, yeah. Yeah, it makes no sense, but I can't do anything about it. <laughs> and have you, you've seen the movie Jaws, I presume? Way too many times, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Well, that makes sense. Okay. Um, I want to show a picture of you now with your parents and your siblings at the 2016 Games in Rio. And yours is 
Well, you've got quite the sporting family. Your brother Jamie's a mm. defenseman for the Seattle Kraken in the NHL. Your parents and your sister Haley have also played sports competitively. So I guess the question is, was it sort of preordained that you were going to be a high-performance athlete? Um, honestly, I think in my family it's more so we're all pushed to really do our best in whatever we want to pursue. Like my sister right now, she isn't really doing sports. She's working out obviously outside of what she's doing, but she's working in urban planning and she is like way beyond where she should be at her age. And um, I think it's just something that was always kind of instilled in our family growing up was just always picking something you love and really pursuing it and giving it 110% all the time. And I think we all are like that just day to day and we all just want to be the best we can be as athletes and as people. So how did it end up being swimming for you? Uh, it was honestly pretty random. Um, like I kind of said, growing up, we, we were in a lot of sports. We were always switching sports, and my parents always instilled in us to just be a part of a team and really kind of get that understanding for what life would kind of be like growing up. I think sports get you gets you ready for that. So we would always switch around different sports all the time, and I decided I wanted to quit doing gymnastics and dance, which is what I was doing, and so... My parents told me I had to pick something, and I randomly decided to do swimming, and I didn't know what I was getting myself into. I didn't understand the sport that much, but I decided to do it and really put, like, all my effort into being good at it. Now, I've heard this, and you can tell me if it's a rumor or if it's actually true. What <laughs> I've heard is that you were actually rejected from some swim clubs when you started off. Is that true? Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, it was like three swim clubs I was rejected by when I first started off, but definitely understandable. I had no idea what I was doing. I didn't know what different strokes were. I didn't know what kicking was. It was it was a bit of a mess at first. Now, can I presume that at some point you have taken the seven medals and put them around your neck and gone back to all those swim clubs and said, I think <laughs> you guys might have blown this. No, no, I, I would never do that. I, I think the swimming community is very small, and I mean, it used to be, but now it's a lot bigger, but it, it used to be pretty small, and I think it was very, like, high level, and they were always looking for kids that kind of knew what they were doing, and I think now, if I've shown anything to swim clubs in Ontario and in Canada, it's to kind of take a chance on those kids that don't really know what uh, what's going on at first, but have that work, work ethic to get better. When you got rejected, why didn't you just quit? Uh, because I, 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 that's just not really something my family does. We're not, <laughs> none of us are really quitters. It's kind of like, I'm going to push this until I absolutely can't do it anymore. So for me, it was like, okay, I'll try again somewhere else and I'll learn something every time I get rejected and I'll learn something every time I'm told something. And that's kind of how I got better onto my last like try out. Hmm. Now the, the the sport you've taken up is just so I mean I don't even know where to begin to describe it. it, it it's such an elite you've got to be so good to be so good in this very mm -hmm. elite sport. And you went to public school in Toronto's East End. And I just um I got to ask you like was there ever a temptation along the way to go to an independent school or a private school where maybe the facilities were better or the coaching was better or anything like that? Um, yeah, I mean, I didn't train out of my public school. I trained at the High Performance Center, which was really good for me. But I think just having that public school experience was such a good thing for me. I met so many friends who I'm still friends with now. And it's just good for me to have that life outside of swimming and then be able to leave school and then go to where I have to focus on swimming. So for me, I loved it so much. Was it Monarch Park Collegiate? Is that where you went? Yeah, yeah. I love Monarch. It was good school. <laughs> and and I gather they have a portrait of you up in the school now. Is that right? Um, I think they do. I'm honestly, I think they did. I don't know if they still do. Have you but, seen it? Um, I, I, I did go when they, like, first put it up and everything. But, um, yeah, I, I, I don't know if it's still up right now. <laughs> Is that unbelievably <laughs> cool or unbelievably embarrassing to see yourself up on up on the wall there? I don't know. I always say it. It's weird to me. It's weird to see, like, why why there's a little bit of interest in me. It weirds me out sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I get it. Uh, Penny, tell me this. Uh, I, I'm sure people want to know how much of a, quote-unquote, normal life you are able to have 
when you are training as much as you do. So let's start with training. How many hours a day? Um, it can kind of vary. Like today, I'm only training once. So I was at the pool from nine and I finished around like 1145 ish. But um, on days where we have two training sessions, we'll go from 745 until like 10 30 11 and then be back here for 3 3 30 and stay till like 6 to 7 ish so it kind of varies on the day and how much of your training is actually in the water as opposed to on land it's definitely a big mix i think that's something that people don't expect with swimming and that's something i've honestly been kind of trying to show on my instagram a little bit is just how much work we do outside of the water as well as inside the pool so we're training for like an hour, an hour and a half, probably a day is usually dry land outside of the water training. And then we're in the water for around an hour and a half to two hours after that. Is it an advantage or a disadvantage to have big muscles if you want to be a fast swimmer? Uh, I don't know. I think it varies. I think for some people, some swimmers can really put on muscle super easily. And I think it's good to have that lean muscle. I think it's not that good to have those like aesthetic big muscles, you know what I mean? <laughs> mm -hmm. And do you do a lot of weightlifting as part of your training? Yeah, we weightlift around three times a week, maybe four. And then we do like circuits and dry land training another like three to four times the week, through the week. I don't mean this to be a rude question, but you're 21. Are you still mm -hmm. growing? I honestly think I might be. I, I keep, every time people see me, they are always asking if I've gotten taller. So I, I might be growing a little bit. <laughs> How tall are you now? I don't know. I thought I was six foot, six one, but recently I saw a friend who swore that he was six feet tall and I was like maybe two, three inches taller than him. So <laughs> I'm, I'm a little worried, honestly. Do you ever get to the pool at 7.45 in the morning and say to yourself, I just can't do this right now. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've definitely had those days. And what do you sure. do when that happens? Um, I mean, at the High Performance Center, you don't really have a choice. It's kind of you have to show up and get it done. But um, I think for me, I really had to find that balance in my life where I had to find a balance outside of swimming and in the pool and really just make sure that I was happy with what I was doing and set my priorities straight. And I think it took me a couple of years to figure it all out and to really just become okay with what I was doing and the amount of work I was putting in all the time for the last like 10 years. I had to just kind of come to terms with the fact that if I want to be a good athlete, this is what I have to do. And, um, and it's what I get to do, and I'm lucky I get to do it. So once I kind of change my attitude to that, I, I get to do it instead of I have to do it, that's where it kind of motivates me a little bit more. And what happens when you have a disagreement with your coach? Maybe the coach wants you to do one thing in terms of training, and you think to yourself, that's not going to be helpful to me in the slightest. How do you resolve that? Uh, I mean, we've definitely gotten into some talks like that, my coach and I, but I think... Again, it's just understanding when you need that rest and when you don't. So I think he knows when I really, really need it. And I have kind of figured that out over the last couple of years again, is just mentally knowing when I can handle pain, when I can't, when I actually need time off, when I don't. So it's, it's honestly constantly trying to figure things out all the time. Actually, here's how I imagine it going in my head. I imagine you saying to your coach, I'm Penny Alexiak, damn it. I've got seven medals and I don't need to do anything you tell me to do. Is that how it goes? Oh, no, never. He would tell me to get out. <laughs> that would not fly here. So let me circle back to that first question I asked when we started talking about your training, and that is, how much of a normal life can somebody who's a high-performance athlete actually have? Uh, I think pretty normal. I think for me that's also, I don't know, my, I, I kind of give everything to my parents they they were really helpful in my upbringing and um figuring out how to have that normal lifestyle outside of swimming so i think when i was like 14 to 18 they really taught me how to have that balance and figure that out and now it's kind of just regular for me i i 
train and then I hang out with my friends or I go home and I just chill outside of swimming and I always make sure I find time to see friends, to do activities, to do things I love to do. So for me, it's become pretty easy to balance it out, but um, it was definitely, it took a lot of figuring out when I was younger. But for example, could you have a chocolate bar and a soda pop if you wanted to? Oh yeah, I, I definitely believe in like, for me, just eating what I wanna eat kind of when I wanna eat it, but making sure again that I have that balance and I'm not overdoing it because that's very easy to do for me. I love chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> but I presume you've got a pretty strict diet that you have to adhere to, do you not? Not really right now. That's something that I am trying to um, look into a bit more this year and I'm going to be working with our team's nutritionist a lot more this year to really kind of dial in my nutrition and make sure that I can get it as high performance and helpful as possible for me with recovery and everything like that because I really want to make sure that I'm like at my peak and the best I could ever be by 2024. Sure. Do you have any pre-race superstitions that you indulge in? Uh, I think I do, but I always say I don't. I think I, I am very like skeptical with everything I do and I'm always doing the exact same thing every time before I race, but Nothing specific I can think of. It's literally everything in the two hours leading up to it. <laughs> now, um, I'm a big baseball fan, big hockey fan, and these are two sports that have gone gaga for analytics. Every mm -hmm. single thing needs to be data crunched so that, of course, coaches or managers or players or whatever can make their best decisions. Do they have the same kind of sort of over-the-top analytics in swimming? And if so, uh, how do you use them to help you? Um, yeah, I mean, we do a lot of video work stuff. That's pretty big for us. And just seeing um, how many strokes we take in a length, seeing how many kicks we do underwater, how powerful our kicks are, how powerful our strokes are. And like, um, pretty much you're just always trying to work to get to like where you can work as little as possible, but still be as fast as possible. So I mean, the less strokes you can do and the faster they can be, the better. So it's definitely a very, like, analytical sport. And I think there's a lot of, like, video work we do, a lot of timing stuff we do. And so it's it's definitely, I think, a little bit up there with swimming or baseball and hockey. Right. But I wonder if when you're actually in the pool in the middle of a race, do, do you actually think about, are you conscious of the analytics and making it work for you at that moment, or is it all just sort of instinct and training at that point? Um, it's a little bit of both. I mean, we train so much so that when it comes to racing, we don't have to think as much because we're a bit oxygen deprived when we're racing. But um, uh, I, I definitely think about it. I think when I race, I'm always very conscious of like the angles of my arm when I'm swimming and how fast my turns are and how many kicks I do and how powerful my start is and everything like that. You are known for being a strong finisher. Not everybody's a strong finisher, right? Some people get out to a great start and then hang on, but you're known for your strong finishes. Do you know why that happens to be part of your repertoire? I think it was just something I was always subconsciously working on growing up. I, I always noticed when I would do swim sessions, I would kind of progress as the set went on and I would get faster near the end of the session than I would at the beginning of it. And also it's something I work on outside of the pool. So in the weight room, it's just making sure that my last reps are just as good, if not better than my first reps. And I think that just kind of translated into my racing where I do take it out a little bit slower, but I'm able to kind of bring it back fast. I guess. <laughs> now, Penny, I want to ask you about nature versus nurture as well, because I'm wondering whether, I'm wondering whether if you just put your mind to being the, the greatest hockey player, for example, that you could possibly be, or who knows, maybe a track and field athlete, would you have just as much success because nature has decided you're a high performance athlete? Is that how it works? I don't know, honestly. I've never really put as much effort into anything else I've done other than swimming. I think it's just I have a, a certain love for swimming and that like pushes me to want to go in and get better every day. I, I'm also very
very uncoordinated outside of swimming. So I've tried other sports and I'm not very good at them. Uh, so for now, just going to stick with swimming and I'm going to just kind of stay with that. <laughs> now, fair enough. But I, I can imagine there'd be some people watching this who would be thinking the notion of spending hour after hour after hour after hour in a pool just is not very interesting to me. So what is it, <laughs> what is it about that experience that is so motivating to you? Uh, I've honestly just really learned to love the whole technique portion of it and just like the whole training portion of it is really fun for me. I love doing filming work and seeing how powerful I can make my stroke and seeing like how I can get better. And I just love that swimming is always getting faster and there hasn't been a time where it's just like stopped and it, no one can get faster than that. It's constantly getting faster all the time and it's just crazy to see all these athletes and how they can drop seconds in a year every year. It's wild to me. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you if I, I, I'm going to do this delicately, but I want to ask uh, a kind of a serious question, which is we have seen in the past year, Simone Biles, Carrie Price of the Montreal Canadiens, uh, Naomi Osaka, the tennis player. We have seen young and not so young. Carrie Price is not so young anymore. Um, High performance athletes deal with mental health challenges, the likes of which I don't think we've ever seen before, or it certainly has never been this public before. And I wonder, given how much you put into this, whether this is something you think about in your own life. Um, yeah, I mean, I struggled a lot growing up with uh, different mental health challenges. I struggled a lot in the last few years with like eating disorders and really trying to figure all of that out. So. For me, it's definitely things I have thought about. It's stuff that I've had to learn about. I've had to learn about myself a lot. And um, I've had to teach the people around me how to deal with things I'm dealing with. And it's it's definitely been a long learning experience. But I think now, more than ever, athletes are speaking out about it to social channels. And they're speaking out about it to media. And I think that's really important because I think it just is going to kind of push not only other athletes to maybe seek help or maybe to look and see if like they could improve as an athlete or as a person like dealing with these mental health issues themselves or if just a regular person is going to actually just go and actually seek help if they see their favorite athlete is also dealing with things and getting help for it so I think it's really important that athletes are speaking out about the challenges that they've dealt with. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that it's your coach's responsibility and maybe your teammates as well to push you as hard as you can possibly be pushed in hopes of getting medals at the end of the day. But I could also imagine that maybe your folks or your siblings um, might be nervous about how far you think you can push yourself. Do they talk to you about their concerns in that regard? Um, yeah, I've definitely had talks with my parents before about just like their concerns with me, but I think they know at the end of the day that I know when my like breaking point is and I know when I need a break and I know when I need to stop. So for me, I'm just very conscious of that. And I think I know myself pretty well at this point to where I know when I'm getting to that point. And I mean, I've also just worked with so many people who have been able to help me fully understand what I'm going through and understand how to get control over the things that I'm dealing with. Okay, let me ask you one last thing, Penny, and that is, you, you know, I, I presume when you do what you do, you are very focused on a date certain at which time you are going to have to compete in an Olympic Games, for example. And you've told us you're definitely competing in Paris in 2024. Great. But the last Olympics you competed in were delayed by a year because of COVID. So what mm -hmm. kind of toll did that take on you in terms of planning, being ready, etc.? Um... I mean, it was definitely difficult at first when the Olympics were originally canceled or postponed and we were out of the water for around four months and we knew that we only had a year to prepare for the Olympics. So for us, it was really difficult, I think, trying to wrap our heads around the fact that we needed to be really flexible and we needed to really come back and be ready to work once we could get back into the water. So once we got back to the pool, I think it was just we were lucky to be able to train at the center and to be able to have the coaching staff that we do who 
really plan out pretty much our whole year of training in advance to make sure that we know what's going on and we know what we have to be prepared for, even when we didn't know what we had to be prepare, prepared for, really. So it was nice to have our staff who really helped us get through the year and really helped motivate us and keep us on track for the year. And just to be training with the best athletes in the world, it's, it's always motivating every time you come to the pool. And uh, just finally, are, are we witnessing the golden age of women Canadian swimmers right now? I mean, you and Taylor Ruck and, I mean, uh, well, the list goes on. Maggie McNeil, Kayla Sanchez. What do you think? Is this the golden era of female swimming for Canadians? I mean, I almost hope not. I hope <laughs> that once we are all retired, tired and done swimming and everything which is going to be a while because we're all very, very young but I think it I hope it motivates like other young kids in Canada to want to be great and to want to join the center and train with us I mean my coach is constantly bringing in young athletes and trying to get them to train and race with us and learn from us so I think that they can be better than us I guess in the future so I think I hope that this isn't the golden age, but at the same time, it's nice to be a part of it if it is. And let me not forget Summer McIntosh, all of 15 years old, my goodness. Exactly. <laughs> Penny, it was a great delight to speak to you on TVO tonight. We wish you so well in all of your training and everything you got to do to get ready for 2024 in Paris. So, bonne chance. Good luck to you, and thanks for joining us. Thank you so much. Trans-Canada Trail is the longest network of its kind in the world. It goes from Newfoundland and Labrador's Atlantic coast to Vancouver Island and up to the Beaufort Sea. And during COVID, hikers have trekked it as never before. With us now for more in Windsor, Ontario, Eleanor McMahon, President and CEO of the Trans-Canada Trail, former Ontario Cabinet Minister to boot and always a friend of this program. And Ms. McMahon, it is a delight to welcome you back. How are you doing? I'm thrilled to be here, Steve. Thank you very much. I'm well. Thank you very much. I had a walk on the trail this morning, so there's no better way to start the day. Oh, terrific. What part of the trail? Tell us. So I'm in Windsor, as you mentioned, at my where I grew up, and I'm staying with my mom uh, for the Thanksgiving time. And I was out on the Ganacho Trail this morning, which is part of the trail network uh, that you just mentioned, the 28,000-kilometer Trans-Canada Trail. And so if I stand at the end of my mom's street, where I was this morning with my lovely dog... Uh, exercising and getting some fresh air and enjoying the contemplative uh, early morning. Uh, it means that I'm standing on the trail, likely with hundreds of thousands of Canadians right across this country at the same time, which well, is pretty neat. You did a little wee smidge of it, but let's show the whole thing now, shall we? Sure. Sheldon, if you would, bring up this graphic. Uh, now, for those who are listening on podcast and can't see this, this is a very long line I am about to describe. The Trans-Canada Trail, longest multi-use recreational trail network in the world, 28,000 kilometers through every province and territory. It runs coast to coast to coast from Cape Spear in Newfoundland and Labrador all the way out west to Victoria, British Columbia. And then if you consider the north-south axis, it's Tuktoyaktuk in the Northwest Territories to where Eleanor McMahon is right now in Windsor, Ontario. 80% of Canadians live within a half an hour of a trail section. And here in the province of Ontario, we've got 6,000 kilometers of trails as part of this network. Let's go back, Eleanor, 30 years, because I think the trail's history mm -hmm and the guys who put it together go back a few decades. How did it all start? Well, you know, uh, like any great Canadian project, the trail has been a combination of ingenuity, innovation, vision, uh, you know, that opportunity to take an idea and crystallize it uh, and tap into Canadians' emotive desire to love their country and see it as something bigger than themselves. I think all of those things were part of the vision, and I've never met them. So the two gentlemen that really conceived of the trail, Bill Pratt, who's from Calgary, and Dr. Pierre Camus, who was originally from Montreal and uh, now lives in Ottawa. He's quite elderly now. But the two of them conceived of this as part of the 125th anniversary celebrations of our country back in 1992. And the idea of the Trans-Canada Trail has been galvanizing Canadians ever since as an opportunity to connect our country via existing trading routes, via the voyageur, whether you're on the waters of Lake Superior, 
uh, and really just that emotive, imaginative, aspirational idea. And of course, in 20, 2017, sorry, uh, as part of the sesquicentennial, the Trans-Canada Trail reached a national dream of connection end to end to end and taking all of that trail of trails idea and connecting it into the longest network in the world, as you mentioned. Okay, a couple things to follow up on there, because obviously sure. this didn't start as one continuous trail. It was, it was how many, many different trails that eventually got connected together? Well, it was over 400, but now it's over five. Over 500, the trail, okay. mm -hmm, We say that the trail is connected, but it's not complete. And that's because it continues to grow, uh, both in dimension and in length, and those local spurs are really important. We say that the trail is national in scope and local in execution for a reason. It's because whether you're in Windsor or in Victoria or Tuktoyaktuk, as you mentioned, um, or when we had our national board meeting in Ottawa last weekend, you're in the Gatineau Hills, you get to meet the people who actually make the trail happen at a local level. And we have over 500 relationships with trail groups across Canada that really fortify and edify what the trail has become. These are volunteers who often work in their spare time to bring the trails to life in their community. And those people really are the heart and beating soul, uh, the beating heart and soul, sorry, <laughs> of the Trans-Canada Trail right across, right across the country. And is it they absolutely 100% totally continuous? It is. Mm -hmm. Really? Yep. So it starts mm -hmm. in Newfoundland and Labrador. You could start there and you could literally keep going on that trail, no interruptions, all the way to Victoria. Well, that's really kind of the, one of the most amazing things about it. Um, one of the um, originators and most passionate Canadians about the trail, Valerie Pringle, um, many Canadians will know Valerie from her broadcast career, you know her. Absolutely. And she's been a volunteer and leader on our board. Uh, she's just stepping off after many, many years of service. But her passion for the trail emanates from that idea um, she told a story recently about being with a group of Canadian school children where she said to them, I believe she was in Peterborough, if you left your schoolyard right now and turned right, you could end up in Cape Spear, Newfoundland. If you turned left, you could end up in, in Victoria. If you went north, you could you could emanate and be in Tuktoyaktuk. And whether you see those touch points as the start of the trail or the end of the trail, the imaginative beauty of that is that you can be uh, on coast on either coast of this country and connect with someone who's standing on the Trans Canada Trail and could be thousands and thousands of kilometers away from you. The vastness of this country is connected by the Trans Canada Trail. And it's really, uh, again, an emotive and imaginative and aspirational idea that continues to flourish. And of course, the pandemic has really seen a vigorous uptake by Canadians of trail use. And now, the good news is our data tells us it's going to continue. I, you know, I, I noticed that because I saw a, a recent Leger survey the other day which mm -hmm. showed the trail use is up 40 percent year over mm -hmm. year. What do you attribute mm -hmm. that to? Well, it's we wanted to go beyond the anecdotal, but our trail uh, groups are telling us that they're seeing more people out than ever. Uh, I'm seeing it. Um, I saw it just this morning. I saw it all weekend as Canadians are outdoors. I think the pandemic and its social isolation has driven people outside where they feel safer, where there's an opportunity to connect. And I think that word connect has had a powerful impetus during the pandemic as people think about how the social order has changed. The pandemic has had profound implications on us all, be they tragic implications, mental health implications, isolated seniors, isolated Canadians of all ages, and being outside and on the trail uh, really has been the healing factor for them. And that's what's showing up in our data too. So not only are they using trails more, but 95% of Canadians in that same survey said that mental health and enhancing their mental health, an equal measure to those saying their physical health, by the way, is really what got them out their front door with their shoes on. And that's the other nice part of the trail, about Trail Sorry and the Trans-Canada Trail in particular, is that you don't need a lot of equipment. You know, in Canada, we say there's no bad weather, only bad clothing. <laughs> and so if you have a warm coat in the wintertime and a hat and a pair of gloves and and some decent walking shoes, you can go pretty much anywhere. And that's the beauty of the trail too, because there's 
uh, there's an equal measure of that that speaks to the equity and the importance of getting outside. And as Canadians were driven indoors, unfortunately, and more and more isolated, many of us found ourselves, especially if we live in a densely populated urban environment, in, in our box, sometimes in the sky with no backyard. And so the desire to get outside because we were living and working in the same environment became that much more pronounced. So getting outside, connecting to nature, we know that it has positive mental health benefits. We did a campaign with CAMH last year at the onset of winter because we knew what was coming. And we knew that Canadians would profoundly feel the encroaching and oncoming uh, darkness and isolation. And we were concerned about their mental health. And it turns out a lot of people were as well. So our Ablaws to Oz campaign hmm. featured leading Canadians across the country, mayors, Olympic athletes, doing a social media campaign with Cam H and us to talk about those mental health benefits. And I'm seeing that more every day myself as I get out on the trail. And uh, anecdotally, I'm seeing more people. It's allowed me to meet people in my neighborhood that I otherwise would not have met. And I think Canadians are rediscovering their communities, their connections, there's that word again, to each other and to the world around them and to nature, which is also pervasive. Canadians love the great outdoors and they love to find opportunities to connect to that nature in their backyard, down the street, around the corner, across town, on their bicycle or with their walking shoes. And that's what the trail does. I totally get the, the physical and mental health aspects. They sort of speak for themselves. But mm -hmm. what about economic health? Does the trail contribute to the country's economic health in any way? Well, that's the other interesting thing. We did a study with the Conference Board of Canada last fall that underscored not only the existing but potential economic um, drivers that really speak to the trail's um, ecosystem impact. What I mean by that is uh, the trail is a conveyor of people again, to each other, to their communities, but also from a tourism perspective. I had the privilege of being the tourism minister in Ontario. And what I saw there was a sector um, that whose vibrancy really is about those local experiences. And that has been underscored by the pandemic too. We're seeing Destination Canada turn itself inside out from becoming that agency of the federal government that marketed Canada to the world to now marketing Canada to Canadians. And so those staycation opportunities that have arisen as a consequence of people's concerns about traveling, and in point of fact, public health has told us that we shouldn't and can't go far. And so people are rediscovering their own backyards and looking at the joys of that. And right along the trail, wherever you are, whether it's in Colling Collingwood or Canmore, our local businesses that speak to the local food, the local craft brewery, the local wineries, and these businesses are often contiguous along the side the trail. And people's opportunity to go visit them is really going to be what sustains the tourism sector in the longer term. This is an emerging idea. It's actually not a new idea, but it's it's been given impetus because of the pandemic as small businesses have struggled and Canadians are being urged to go local and visit local and support their local small businesses. And many of those are restaurants and attractions right in their own communities. So the trail is what conveys people to and fro those connections, brings them to those beautiful global assets, whether it be Niagara Falls or Banff National Park, and alongside all those wonderful small businesses that really could use the injection of feet on the street and people walking in and buying a meal and spending time and that's what's going to help power our economy and, and its return to health. Having said that, I want to ask you about how concerned you are about climate change because obviously there are a lot of fires more now it seems than ever before. There are tornadoes, mm -hmm. there are hurricanes, there are, mm -hmm. there's all sorts of environmental damage happening in this country right now and I'm, I'm sure the trail can't be exempt from that. What kind of damage has the trail sustained as a result of climate change? Yeah, absolutely. The trail continues to be damaged by our changing climate. We see that whether we're in Nova Scotia, on the Atlantic Ocean, we see that in the forest fires that have raged across the western provinces in particular and in northern Ontario. And, you know, the, the trail really is, in addition to being a conveyor of people to each other and to nature, it is a place of reconciliation. 
our indigenous partnerships are incredibly valuable and important to us. We are enriched by them. But we see in in those um, through that guardianship lens that our indigenous partners bring opportunities to renew the land, um, make sure that we're taking care of Mother Nature, but also that um, when these forest fires occur, we, it's it's certainly about building back better, but it's also about ensuring that the trail remains robust. The trails since 1992 and since it was conceived has enjoyed close to $100 million of government support, most of it federal, but we're fortunate to have tremendous provincial and municipal partners. And dare I say, Steve, because we just had an election, probably important to mention that we were in the platforms of two of the uh, political parties, the, uh, the Progressive Conservative Party of Canada and the Liberal not, Party. Not Progressive Both anymore. Had, I, I, no, I hate it. It's just sorry, the Conservative Party now. Forgive me. The Conservative <laughs> Party of Canada. Forgive me. I know it's CPC, but I didn't want to use the acronym. Forgive me. Thank you, Steve. And the Liberal Party of Canada, both of whom had the uh, trail in their platform. And I think that's a reflection of uh, the fact that the trail enjoys broad-based support by Canadians from coast to coast to coast that politicians see the importance of the trail and in the context of climate change, understand that investing in the trail now, continuing to ensure that the asset that we steward remains robust, uh, especially in the context of our changing climate. So we are definitely seeing the trail erode um, and be severely impacted, and that's not going to change. We know that climate change is here. Uh, I would say on a very positive note, however, that the conservation aspects relative to the trail are important for enhancing our biodiversity. Right now, the world is at the Convention on Biodiversity, uh, and there's a big meeting in China in the spring where the globe, global partners are going to gather to talk about protecting 30% of the world's landmass and oceans by 2030 and the imperative of that and ensuring that we have um, less of a threat in terms of our endangered species. And trails are an important opportunity to create the kind of connection for wildlife and preservation and conservation that's going to ensure that we meet our 30 by 30 commitments and we are a vehicle for, um, again, mitigating that change in climate. Uh, and so there's a positive story that we can tell about robust um, nature conservation. And on the other hand, making sure that we continue to protect and preserve the trail given the, the impacts of climate change. Okay, a few minutes to go here, Eleanor, and I want to see if I can get two more items on the table here. Number one, I mean, obviously, you, you can run on it, you can snowshoe on it, you can cross-country ski on it, you can cycle on parts of it, but I want to know what's kosher and what's not. Can you snowmobile on it or can you motorcycle on it or that, those kinds of things? There are areas of the country where motorized use is allowed. Um, and it depends which province you're in because uh, transportation tends to be a provincial responsibility. And so as stewards of the trail, we try to be a good partner to government wherever we are. So, for example, we have done surveys uh, and uh, through our partners at Leger in different provinces in the country that demonstrate that Canadians want non-motorized access <clears throat> excuse me, to be predominant. And that doesn't mean that we exclude that uh, the other, but it means that politicians and policymakers uh, need to know and understand that Canadians in their part of the world, and again, this is a provincial responsibility, have, um, have a preference, and that preference is non-motorized transportation. So it's difficult because it sounds like we're uh, favoring one to the exclusion of the other, but having spent some time doing bicycle and active transportation public policy work as you know there's a way for us to find accommodations for both and again that is based on which province of the country that you're in we just ask that policymakers give due consideration to that non-motorized contingent as much as they may consider opportunities for snowmobiling and other motorized transportation because we are certainly aware of the importance of that economic impact Okay, and let's get this in because we're still a couple of weeks, a uh, couple of weeks to go in the second annual Great Canadian Hike, mm -hmm. which is September fifteenth to the end of October. Just give us a bit of flavor of what that's all about. Well, we started this event last year uh, during a global pandemic because we saw what you and I talked about earlier, which was growing use of trail across the country, and we wanted to give Canadians that opportunity in October during Thanksgiving as we gather together. And since that connection 
um, had been disrupted, we thought, wouldn't it be neat to give them that opportunity to gather safely outdoors? So even though last year, Steve, when we started this pandemic, and certainly there are still constraints in terms of indoor gatherings, but outdoors, the ability to gather is a lot easier. So is there an opportunity for us to encourage Canadians to gather outdoors, to log their, their kilometers on the trail, be it cycling or walking or paddling, and and bring awareness to that and joy to that, certainly, and enter contests. Um, we've got some wonderful sponsors that we've lined up. And again, this just underscores what we're seeing more and more, that Canadians are finding opportunities to have uh, immersive conversations, to gather and to connect, because that physical connection has been missing, but they're finding it on the trail. And for us, uh, for those of us that steward the trail, it's such an enormous privilege to see that happening and to realize that more and more Canadians are doing so. And the exciting thing for us is that 72% of Canadians in our polling are saying that, yes, I've used trails more often. Some of those are new trail users, which is really exciting. And I'm going to continue doing it, is what they told us, after the pandemic, if we see an end to this, which we hope we all will soon, Steve. And 25% of those Canadians said, we're going to use trails even more now. So this has whetted their appetite. And perhaps it's the silver lining to a very dark cloud that they have found an opportunity to gather outdoors, to be closer to nature and to each other. And that connective fascia that the trail represents has really seen a, a real moment in time now. And our job is to ensure that that momentum continues. That's former Ontario Cabinet Minister Eleanor McMahon, the President CEO of Trans Canada Trail. So nice to have you on the agenda again, Eleanor. Thank you can take you. care and, and get out there and enjoy that trail some more. I will. Thank you, Steve. You too. Take care. People across Ontario rely on the Great Lakes for many things. Did you know that includes, for some, surfing? Yes, I said surfing. Here to explain, Antonio Lennart, founder and CEO of the community surf shop and cafe, Surf the Great. Thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Now, I should mention that our Southwestern Ontario Hub journalist, Mary Baxter, interviewed Antonio for an article that can be read on tvo.org, but it's nice to have you in studio as well. Now, I have a bunch of questions, but I think the first natural one is, how did you discover lake surfing? Uh, it's a bit of a long story. It's, uh, it's actually interesting because people have been surfing on the Great Lakes since the 60s. So it's nothing new, but it's, it's grown in popularity over the last like 10 years. Uh, I moved to Canada via California about 10 years ago. I was born in Brazil. And for my first three years in Toronto, I had no idea I could surf here. It was actually funny because as a surfer, I've always loved surfing and I would travel to places to surf. And I loved Toronto, but I would go to the lake and stare into the horizon. And I would tell myself, oh my God, if only there were waves here, this would be a perfect city to live in. <laughs> and um, it was actually on a family vacation that I went with my partner to the Bahamas that I met a surfer surfing one of the outer islands. And it uh, turned out that he was from Toronto and he was the one who told me that I could surf back home. That's very interesting. Now, I wanna pull up this photo right here. You have a convincing job to do. This is not a lake. This cannot be a lake. Uh, it is, in fact, a lake. Where are and, we? Um, so we are at Scarborough Bluffs. Uh, oh, wow. Yeah, so this is a spot that we call Mini Mavs. It's right in front of the bluffs. Beautiful spot. Uh, it's one of the biggest waves that we have around here in Toronto. It doesn't work as often, but when it does, it's just as powerful as the ocean. Now, you had mentioned you, you, you were born and raised in Brazil, moved to California, you've seen the ocean, uh, you've now you know, surfed in the lakes. What's the main difference between lake and ocean surfing? Yeah, uh, that's a great question, actually. So the main difference is the lack of salt. So since it's fresh water, that affects our buoyancy. So you need mm -hmm. to compensate with like a board that has a little bit more flotation. Um, and another difference is just the way that the waves are formed. So for example, in the ocean, they're formed you know, in, on the other side of the world. So by the time they reach their destination, 
they're their own being. Like they're, you know, they have a lot of power. They are organized. Here on the on the Great Lakes, we tend to surf in the eye of the storm. So you know, wow. the waves we ride in Toronto originate in Hamilton, or sometimes in Prince Edward County. So it's it, it tends to be a lot messier, and the the waves come at you uh, a lot faster and from many directions. So it's just uh, those are the two main differences. So there's a little predictability in the ocean versus the lake, I guess. Absolutely, yeah. So the ocean, you know, you often have more time to you know look at those waves coming at you get ready here on the lakes they they kind of like they just keep coming you got to be ready gotcha. to go at any time all right so i want to look at some photos of some winter conditions because you guys also you guys kind of surf all year round we do so the best season is fall through spring so summertime it gets a little bit quieter but there are still some waves on like georgian bay lake here and lake erie but, but uh, there's some ice that's like <laughs> exactly. So winter is our best season here in Toronto. Uh, one of the main reasons is it doesn't take a lot of wind for us to get waves. Uh, and also due to how warm the city is, it tends to keep our shorelines open here. Okay. So we keep getting waves in Toronto throughout the winter months. Now, if storm conditions are needed for lake surfing, how do you stay safe? Yeah, so it's, uh, you know, you, you got to be a, a decent surfer. Uh, there are definitely ways to start here. You know, you can be a beginner here. That's not a problem. There are places that are suitable for beginners and places that are suitable for intermediate advanced people. But uh, when you're surfing the winter, you just got to have a, a strategy plan. One, you need to make sure you have the right gear. And uh, before you go into the water, you just need to know your limits and you need to have everything ready to warm up in your car when you come back. So. Would you say it's easier to start on a lake versus an ocean, or what would you recommend for someone? No, I'd say it's definitely easier to start in the ocean. Hmm. Uh, it's not impossible to start here. I know a lot of surfers who have started surfing on the Great Lakes, and they're great surfers now, and you know our community keeps growing. But uh, the ocean is just a little bit more consistent. You know, if you have the opportunity to go away for a week and you know take a surf camp or something, learn there, and then come back and keep practicing, that's a little bit easier. Now, I had mentioned, you know, uh, when we were off camera that, you know, a lot of people might be hesitant just thinking about the Great Lakes swimming and the Great Lakes surfing uh, is probably not even a thought. But there are other risks when we talk about, you know, pollution, algae bloom. There are, there are other things that you, you're kind of navigating in the water. Absolutely. So the water quality all over the Great Lake the Great Lakes have improved dramatically since I moved here. Uh, there are many great organizations doing a tremendous amount of work to clean the water and to, to promote safer waters for everyone. Um, each lake has their own issues in terms of algae blooms and you know nuclear waste and uh, pipelines. Here in Toronto, Hamilton, like Lake Ontario, one of our biggest issues is pollution. So the lake is good, I would say 95% of the time, whenever there is heavy rainstorms, mm -hmm that overflows or uh, sewage capacity, that's when raw sewage washes into the into the lake. Uh, luckily, these days, the city tells the population when they're bypassing sewage, so we know uh, when the water has been compromised. Uh, but yeah, pollution, you know, just like any other big city around the world is an issue for our waterways. All right, so I wanna look at another photo. Sure. Uh, it looks like you're warming up in your car. It looks like you're, you're you're quite cold or you're ready to get you're ready to get in the zone you're in the zone is what it looks like uh, how important is it to have a kind of a good exit strategy and what does a good exit strategy look like uh, that's crucial so if you're going to surf in the winter the moment it, it drops below freezing you just need to have an exit plan uh, well, you know, if you are on a surf trip, if it's warm, there is always like, oh, one more wave, one more wave, and next thing you, you see, it's been like half an hour, and you caught ten waves, and you're still there. Here, once you lose your capacity to stay warm, so moving, generating heat, uh, you kind of just have to leave the water and get out to your car because from the moment you start getting cold to the moment you start warming up, there is like twenty to thirty minutes gap there and if it's been snowing there will be snow up to your knees you might have to you know hike 10 10 minutes 15 minutes back to your car so i always like to make sure that i have everything laid out in my car you know i have my towel i have a thermos with a hot water or a tea uh the moment i get there i throw my board under my car open the car hop in turn the car on turn on the heat you know put some music start having some tea and that that was what that photo was ah, okay. i had just returned to my car and i was warming up and uh, just waiting for 
for the heater to kick in. And once you start to, you know, feel warm again, then you can get rid of your wet mittens, dry your hands, put on some dry uh, gloves, then you can go deal with your board and do whatever. But really like having a strategy, like an exit plan so that you, you stay safe. Right? Now, it seems like you obviously have an amazing photographer following you when you're surfing, but is it always good to surf with a group of people or uh, do you usually go on solo trips? Yeah, absolutely. So I think surfing is, is more fun with friends. Uh, we always recommend people to have a, you know, always surf with a buddy because, uh, you know, there are no lifeguards around here, right? The lifeguards are just here during the summer months. So during the time they were out on the water, we as surfers are responsible for each other's safety. So if you have other people surfing with you, we're keeping an eye on each other. Uh, I do surf alone sometimes, but whenever I go alone, I always let someone know, you know, hey, this is where I'm paddling out. This is the time. I'll leave a note on my car, like out surfing, this is my location, got out at this time, so that something happens at least you know someone may see that node and, and can activate help. All right, so let's say I'm interested in surfing. I want to tag along with you. What type of gear would I need uh, for colder temperatures? Yeah, so we surf with wetsuits. So some people think that we surf with dry suits. Uh, dry suits are not suitable for surfing. They're just really bulky, so it's hard to paddle and to, to do the movements that we need to, to do in order to surf. So really thick wetsuits, they're five, six millimeters. We wear mittens that keep all the fingers together. We wear like seven millimeter booties. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, so it's like really thick okay. rubber, uh, but it's incredible. The technology has come to a place where we can surf for like three to four hours when it's minus 20 out. So that's kind of like the basic uh, package that you need. And uh, once you have that, the waves are free, so you know. Hmm. Well, it was a pleasure. Thank you so much for kind of changing the perspective on the Great Lakes for us for a little bit. Pleasure is mine. And that is the agenda for Tuesday, October 12, 2021. As more people move out of the big city to places such as Hamilton, should municipalities expand boundaries or increase density? Tomorrow, we'll examine that debate, which is going on right now in The Hammer. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Ontario Hubs are made possible by the Barry and Lori Green Family Charitable Trust and Goldie Feldman.